Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Connie Lester, and I am the editor of the Florida Historical Quarterly. In this podcast, you will hear an interview with Dr. Nancy J. Levine on an article she wrote with her students entitled T-Sets, Tractors, and T-1 Lines, The Survival of a Small Town Library, the Hastings Branch Library, Hastings, Florida. In addition to this article, the fall 2009 issue of the quarterly includes three articles that span the range of Florida history. William C. Barnett's article, Inventing the Conch Republic, the creation of Key West as an escape from modern America, explores the real Key West of maritime traffic, wrecking, fishermen, cigar manufacturing, and economic myth-making. Kimberly Wilmot Voss looks at newspaper coverage of the Florida efforts to enact the Equal Rights Amendment in her article, The Florida Fight for Equality, The Equal Rights Amendment, Senator Lori Wilson, and Mediated Catfights in the 1970s. She argues that journalists neglected the issues of the ERA struggle to focus on a media-generated catfight between opposing views. Kevin Kokomore, a doctoral student, explores the current literature on the role of slavery and maroon communities in early Florida history in his article, A Reassessment of Seminoles, Africans, and Slavery on the Florida Frontier. Our interview is with Dr. Nancy J. Levine, who is an associate professor in English at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville. She and her students, who are co-authors for the article, undertook a research project on the history of the Hastings, Florida Branch Library. Their documentary evidence and oral interviews uncovered a rich community life that was expressed in the support for the library. The article appears under the heading Florida Classroom, an occasional publication of the Florida Historical Quarterly that presents materials that can be incorporated into classrooms or provide examples of class projects. Dr. Robert Casanello, a University of Central Florida assistant professor in history and a member of the Florida Historical Quarterly editorial board, interviewed Dr. Levine for this podcast. Please enjoy this discussion of the important role of the library in the life of Hastings, Florida. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. I have a Ph.D. in American Literature from Columbia. Uh, I'm teaching at the University of North Florida. I've been there since 1985 in the Department of English. And right now I'm like my courses tend towards Southern literature and uh, African American literature, so I wasn't exactly the perfect person to write a history. It kind of grew on me. Um, now, where can you tell everyone where where Hastings is, and maybe how you got involved in this specific project? Yeah, Hastings is west of St. Augustine on the uh, first coast, and it's about 40 or 45 miles south of Jacksonville. Uh, there's a sign, or there used to be a sign at the at the, at the city line that said uh, "Potato Capital of the State." I don't know if it's there anymore, but it's it's a notable site, and it's a small rural town of approximately 500 people. Uh, I got involved in it because I was interested in service learning. Now, Hastings is such a small town that everybody knows everybody else, and uh, so I tried to set up a project where they could do some research on the town itself so that they could do interviews with townspeople. And I went over to the library. She'd already heard about the things I was doing. We hit it off immediately. This was Sandy Sibilich. And on one occasion, she said, you know, I have a friend who would like someone to write a history of the Hastings Library. It's such an interesting history, and nobody has written anything about it. President John Delaney had just put together a transformational learning opportunity project, which had loads of money. And I I suddenly had a eureka moment where I thought, well, I could get funding for this. I could get students involved who are already interested because of the work that I've done with service learning. I'll contact them. They'll help me do the interviews. We'll do the research, and ultimately we'll get together and write a project, write, write the history. Sandy contacted her friend, Pat Lawrence Sell, who's a formal, former chair 
of the St. John's County Library Advisory Board who conceived of this idea. She set up an interview for me with Pat. I sat down with Pat. We got along like a house on fire, and I wrote up the proposal, and when the uh, money came in, we were off and running. Um, Sandy was just splendid. She helped me put together an initial group of people to interview. George Minton was one of them. He was so, so enthusiastic about this project, he had continued working. And around a core cl cluster of students for that uh, f first initial run, we started working on this. And I'm sure the students got a lot out of the project, right? The students who stuck with it um, really did. Uh, George is now um, up for a position on the St. John's Library Advisory Board, and Sandy, another uh, uh, Hastings resident, um, the only true historian we had on this project, who she was getting her undergraduate degree and then her master's degree while we were working on it. She's now working at the St. John's Community College, partly on the strength of having published this particular article. They were they were keen on it. So there's there's material uh, benefit to the students that goes way beyond the actual project itself. I mean, you all make a really great case for the idea that the history of a library could be a window into the history of a community. And um, so what does the library in Hastings tell you about the community in Hastings? That's such a good question that I can visit the group before I try to formulate my own idea. So I'm going to briefly um, summarize what George, Sandy, and Sharon told me when I when I contacted them about this project, about the uh, podcast. Sandy Stratton, who is a resident, said that for her, the library is a microcosm of everything that this community holds dear, uh, its children, its history, which she found out is long and surprising. She's lived there almost all of her life, and she thought when she began this project, library history? Oh, that'll take about 10 minutes. And then five years later, we were still talking about it. She wrote to me this statement, the town is bigger than anyone on the outside can possibly imagine. The library itself is a kind of lodestone. It's a, you see the tip of the iceberg, and underneath it is this accumulation of feeling and information and historical process that we all found fascinating. George, who was our main interviewer, he developed into a really professional interviewer and has, has gone on to do other kinds of work. He felt that what marked this library most of all for him was its survival capacity, that in spite of terrible economic and social problems, the kind that afflict all southern, poor southern towns and in the last 50 years or so, that they survived, that they held together. Not only did they survive, they prevailed. Uh, he found it particularly interesting that the library was an instrument for integration in, in a period of time when Jacksonville and St. Augustine were having riots in the streets. Um, Hastings was quietly opening the doors to African Americans, Hastings Library. And now I'm going to tell you something very brief about the, uh, the position I found myself in as the sort of de facto historian researcher after the project was over, I was looking into where this library fits in. And I found out for myself how amazingly this small rural library's history is linked to a sort of national movement towards self-help that begins with Emerson and works all the way through the 19th, into the 20th century at a time when multimillionaires like Andrew Carnegie were shelling out money to small communities all up and down the eastern seaboard into the Midwest to help elite groups of social, civic-minded citizens put together libraries that would be kind of the jewel in the crown for, for these small towns. They were thinking of an egalitarian ideal of education for the masses. Hastings was quietly developing a reading room. It's the only library I know of that was connected to the home demonstration movement, which was going on at the same time. Home demonstration was dealing with problems of canning, of rural cleanliness, and these women, who one of my students called Pioneers with Teapots, opened several social libraries in basically cubby holes, and they kept the thing going all through the 50s. It was Contrary to the general 
movement, which was from the top down. This was a very grassroots effort. The women who started this library were married to farmers. And I don't know if this is actually true. We couldn't find verification. But I think they must have had dirt under the fingernails. Do, do you see the Hastings and the library in Hastings being sort of a microcosm that, that, that might work as a, as a model for other people? For example, I mean, other people in other small communities, you know, do, do you think their libraries could also a valuable asset to them to understand their community's past? And if so, you know, what, what advice would you give them to explore the history of their local library? Well, again, since this is a group effort, I went to my group. And uh, I'll start with their their opinions on this, this question. Sharon Clellan says, don't go into the project with preconceived ideas about what you'll find. It took us as long as it did because we kept tracking down one idea after another based on very contradictory opinion and information that we got from uh, dozens and dozens of people we interviewed. They were selective in their memories or reluctant to remember, or they had beefs that they wanted to air. And we, we sorted through this and followed down one argument after another until we started to see a pattern emerging. Now, it would have taken less time, I think, if we had started out with a single theme. But not doing it that way, I think we did a, a, a service to the history of the town. And the history of the town is complex. Its social structure is complex. And I think that you have to start by not going in assuming that you know what you're going to find. George um, Minton, who, as I said, became the group's uh, authority on interviewing, recommends that you select participants with different skills and you assuming that what you're going to do is a group project and then assign them areas that would best use their skills. We had all of the, the people that I ultimately selected or that ultimately selected me had writing skills, but George was fantastic as an interviewer. Uh, Sandy Stratton is a historian of amazing capacity, and, and she found us resources that we wouldn't have believed. And she, she loved putting together uh, data for us. Sharon Clellan was a former his, uh, English teacher at a community college, and she had amazing skills of organization. So she helped me put together a, a number of drafts before I vetted them out to the group. Um, Sandy's comment on researching is very valuable, so I'm going to try to summarize it for you. She said that most of the library history that she found was independent of the library itself or the library res resources, like the uh, library system, where we went to, to try to find minutes of meetings and so forth. She said that if you search in unexpected places, not only will you find the information on the subject that you're looking, you'll find out about the community itself. She said, look at Church Bullet, concern yourself with tax and insurance um, events and documents. Look at old town records. Interview people who are only peripherally involved with your subject, and you will find more information. People people stash boxes of letters and pictures that they don't even remember until they, you start asking them questions about this past. <clears throat> and the community got behind this project. 100% people talked about it, and then they'd call Sandy and say, oh, do you know so-and-so? She's got some pictures you ought to look at. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society, which was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in Florida. The Society is based in Cocoa, Florida, and the quarterly editorial offices are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. If you would like to join the Florida Historical Society and receive the Florida Historical Quarterly as a member benefit, please go to the Society website at www.myfloridahistory.org for membership details.